There's no, it has no reason to be a movie, but he made a movie and it's just as funny. Okay, great. Well, I'll watch it tonight. You can watch it tonight. I feel like I'm going to zone out for a minute. Um, you ready to get started? Yeah, yeah let's, let's do it. Um, I think both of your oh. mics are on. Yeah. Okay. So test, to test. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to use a mic to talk to a crowd of four people, but that's all right. It's all right. <laughs> do it. can't hear me at all. Oh, hello. Now you can hear me. <laughs> hello, everyone, and welcome to the People's Forum. Um, we are a political education space, a cultural center, a, a movement incubator for the working class all over the world. Um, we wear many hats, so we are also a bookstore, 1804 Books, you pass on your way in and where you can get tonight's book. Um, we are also a press, so we publish our own books, as well as do everything from concerts to dance workshops, art workshops, of course, book talks. Um, open mics, the list goes on and on. So whether you're in New York or not, we hope you follow us on social media, follow our newsletter, all that stuff, because a lot of our offerings are hybrid, of course. Um, tonight's book talk is on An Enemy Such As This, which is a book that for the first time tells the remarkable true story of an indigenous family who fought back over multiple generations against the world-destroying power of settler colonial violence. And it does this through the epic and intimate story of Larry Casus and those like him who fought against it. From the genocidal American War against the Apaches in the 19th century, through the collapse of the European empires in the first half of the 20th century, and culminating in the efforts of young Navajo activists and organizers in the second half of the 20th century to confront settler, settler colonialism, colonialism in New Mexico, the book offers a resolutely native-focused history of colonialism. And it's really important to us at the People's Forum today, just you can see it in our current political landscape, from the fight to stop line three to an event we're even having on Monday on gold mining in the Amazon. Indigenous people are at the forefront of the fight to protect their land, um, their communities, and we have a lot to learn from their generations of struggle. Um, we're very excited to be joined by David Correa, who is the author of the book. He is a professor of American studies at the University of New Mexico, where he teaches about environmental politics, violence, and its relation to law and property, critical human ge geography, and political economy. In addition to an enemy such as this, he is the author of Properties of Violence, co-author of Police, a Field Guide with Tyler Wall, and co-author with Nick Estes, Melanie Yazzi, and Jennifer Dennettdale of Red Nation Rising from Border Town Violence to Native Liberation. He's also the co-founder of Abolish APD, a research and mutual aid collective in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We are also joined today by the person who wrote the forward and an uh, organizer in her own right, um, Melanie Kayazi is Danae, and she is an assistant professor of the, in the departments of Native American Studies and American Studies at the University of New Mexico, specializing in Navajo American Indian history, political ecology, indigenous feminist and queer studies, and theories of policing and the state, among many other things. Um, Dr. Yazi also organizes with the Red Nation, a grassroots Native-run organization committed to the liberation of indigenous people from colonialism and capitalism, and she is the lead editor of Decolonization, Indigeneity, Education, and Society, an international journal committed to public intellectualism and social justice. Um, this book talk is also brought in partnership with Haymarket, who are the publishers of the book and without whom this event and this book would not be possible. So we hope you check them out as well. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to you both. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kate. And if only, if only Melanie was still a professor at the University of New Mexico. She just left for a job at the University of Minnesota. So um, our loss. I'm now in the Department of American <laughs> Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we, we and I want to I want to thank the People's Forum um, for the invitation. Um, I guess we're supposed to look over there. That's the, that's the, is that the, 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 the on, those, online? these ones? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm really so happy that you, you came all this way. Melanie. I know I haven't seen you in a while. I, that's right. We haven't <laughs> seen each other in a while. Um, so it's nice. Uh -huh. And it makes it easier because I, 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 I the reason I write is because I don't want to talk. <laughs> Seriously. So you like to talk. You're, you know, they say that like you're either a good talker or a good writer, but it's hard to be both. Yeah. No, I agree. But you're a good writer and a good you're talker. You're actually a good writer and a good talker. So, <laughs> so this is just a way for us to compliment each other. <laughs> um, I, I thought uh, the, the best way to start, we were talking about it before, and um, we wanted to read some short passages 
from the book, um, a passage that um, I'll read that I think provides a, a an overview of the book so you can get an idea about what it's about. Because I know that outside of New Mexico and really outside of native people in New Mexico, nobody knows who Larry Casus is. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk a lot about Larry Casus. And then and Melanie will read a, 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 a passage from the forward, which also I think provides some context uh, around Larry's contemporary relevance. Larry Casus, who was a young 19-year-old uh, Navajo activist, was killed by police in 1973 in Gallup. Um, and we'll talk about why he did that. He actually kidnapped the mayor of Gallup and, and died in a gunfight with police. We'll talk about that. And... and, um, and you know, I was really introduced to Larry years and years ago because of his current relevance, particularly on the campus of the University of New Mexico, where you really can't, um, you won't see, you'll see a lot of Native students wearing wearing shirts with Larry's picture on it. And he's become a really important I almost important wore thing. one of mine tonight. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually surprised you didn't because I went, you... I know. I chose to wear the Red Nation shirt instead. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think that that... that Larry's um, importance um, really in contemporary um, radical politics in, in among Native activists and organizers in New Mexico was very much a part of why I wrote the book. Um, and it was also, the, it was a hard book to write because it's, it's so many people for whom Larry is really centrally important. And, and, and at the top of that list is his family. Um, and I, I got to know it, uh, his sisters really well in the course of writing this book. And um, it was a really meaningful experience to me. Um, and, and, I, and I hope, you know, this book um, contributes to, to the work that people do in Larry's name. Mm -hmm. So um, I, before, and so before I, I, is there anything you wanted to say before we get going? Uh, we, I just wanted to reflect. Uh, we had a book launch event um, that was co-sponsored by the Red Nation and Red Media, uh, which is an indigenous-run press. Um, we publish work that nourishes social movements and political movements. Uh, this was at the end of April, so about six months ago, almost six months ago. And this was in Gallup, New Mexico, so Larry was murdered in Gallup, New Mexico. Uh, folks may or may not be familiar with the kind of the political, economic, and racial dynamics of Gallup, New Mexico, but it's the quintessential border town. We talk a lot about reservation border towns um, and the way that settler colonialism and capitalism operate in a hyper-violent way um, and target Native people specifically in one of the books we co-author called Red Nation Rising with Jennifer Dennettdale and Nick Estes. And the reason why I'm saying this is that this event, um, it was the first time that many of us, I think, had gotten together in a political way since the pandemic started. It had been over two years since any significant organizing had happened on the streets and on the ground in Gallup. And it was really an incredible evening because, you know, Larry passed on, what, 50, over 50 years, almost 50 years ago. But the talking about Larry Casus and his legacy reignited really what I would see as a revolutionary spirit amongst working class Native people that night. We had almost 100 people at that event, which is quite large for Gallup. Gallup, I think, has about 20,000 people, is a population of that town. And the energy that night that was really, like I said, reignited simply by talking about Larry um, and coming, I don't know, coming into relation with his family for the first time, I think for many people in the community, because of course, Larry is very significant to the history of indigenous liberation, to organizations like the Red Nation that carry that tradition on. Um, but of course, Larry's also very important to his family. And I think it was the first time that his entire extended family was able to meet the community and especially the political community that really carry Larry in our hearts in to really meet for the first time after 50 years. And that coming together was incredibly powerful and I think will actually provide the basis for the, the next phase, I would say, of on-the-ground revolutionary struggle in that place. And so that's how important Larry Casus is. I mean, it may seem regional, but it's quite literally like his spirit is in all of our hearts as we move forward. And it's, he really provides the foundation for everything that we do in the struggle for indigenous liberation. So thank you, David, for, you know, taking one for the team and writing the book. <laughs> Because it was a hard book to write. Well, it was a hard book to write, but I, um, it's, the, I, it's the most important thing I'll, I'll have ever written in my life. And, and um, I, I loved, um, I, well, it was a gift to be allowed to do it, to be honest, um, because I had a lot of conversations with, with, with Jennifer, Danette, Alcog, and Larry's sisters, and was willing to stop at any point 
Um, and, and of course, uh, my colleague Jennifer Dinettale, um, one of the co-authors of um, Red Nation Rising with us, she's Danae. And she, I asked her one time, I was like, is this okay that I'm writing this book? And she said, and she said, David, I, I wish, I wish a Navajo author yeah. would write it, but, <laughs> but that's, it's been too long. Yeah. And so, and I, I, I completely agree with that sentiment. I think before I read um, this passage, I want to do a little bit, I want to do a brief explanation of the events surrounding the last day of Larry's life to sort of, to sort of explain what happened and, and, um, and that the last days of his life, our last day of his life is often um, the only thing that people know about him. Even, even a lot of organizers and activists in New Mexico really only knew about that last day of his life. Larry, was an organizer with a group called Indians Against Exploitation, which, which organized out of Gallup and Farmington, which was all young and almost entirely Navajo, although there were Pueblo organizers and activists among them, um, focusing on trying to shut down uh, a, a, um, like a, you know, an annual event in Gallup, in particular, that um, really just sort of was commodifying um, Native tradition and Native ceremonies um, and, and beyond that, also doing a lot of sort of mutual aid work. And he was also the president, um, when he was a sophomore at the University of New Mexico, of the Kiva Club, which um, is a really remarkable organization that I think Larry radicalized. And, and they're much more of a, they're, they're a student group, but unlike most student groups at UNM, um, the Kiva Club really um, challenges the university and organizes in a way that, that no other student groups do. And, and Larry was really the first one to shift that, the focus of that group. And he didn't grow up in Gallup and he didn't grow up on the Navajo Nation. His dad um, was a miner, a copper miner. Um, and I'll mention that in the book. So he didn't, he was, he didn't grow up uh, um, on the reservation. Um, he didn't speak um, the language, but they moved to Gallup in like 68, when he started high school and Larry was just shocked at what he found in Gallup, the misery, the sort of like the sort of grinding violence of the border town. And he really made it his mission. This like at the time, a 15 year old kid to sort of cr confront this and to work with others. And he was really, he pushed Indians against exploitation to confront in particular, the mayor of Gallup because the mayor owned the most notorious liquor store, the Navajo Inn. And this liquor store was um, basically just like hovering up beside the Navajo Nation. And um, it was the most deadly stretch of road in the state of New Mexico um, because the, the only way to get there was to walk for a lot of folks. And so there were a lot of um, fatalities on the roadway. There were a lot of exposure death, deaths, which is always a euphemism often in New Mexico for vigilante violence against Native people. And um, Larry, Larry was taking pictures of this and documenting it and trying to confront the, the mayor and the city council about this to try to shut down this l liquor store. He wasn't a, it wasn't a reformist thing, but it was like a short term. We have to do something right now because people are dying every single day. Um, the, the, the level of violence is really quite shocking, I think, for most people who aren't familiar with, with what a border town is and how those operate, which we'll talk about tonight. And, um, and, and then the mayor, um, uh, it was the most profitable liquor store in the entire state of New Mexico, by the way. Um, and then the mayor uh, uh, nominated himself the chair of the alcohol treatment center. And then when Larry came to the University of New Mexico, the governor of New Mexico nominated Emmett Garcia, who was the, the mayor, as a regent at the University of New Mexico. And Larry had had enough by this time. Um, and we could talk a little bit more if in, in Q and A if people are interested about the evolution of his politics, which I try to, I try to do in the book a little bit, um, as much as I can. I never had the the privilege of meeting Larry, but um, and finally he decided the only thing he can do is is kidnap the mayor and until they agree to shut down the bar. So he and another young activist, a native activist, um, hijacked a car at gunpoint at the campus of the University of New Mexico, forced another UNM student who they didn't know to drive them to Gallup where they kidnap the mayor and um, they hold themselves up in a sporting goods store. Um, and Larry um, died in just a barrage of gunfire by police that day. And Robert Nakata and I, his, his, his comrade who was with him on that, survived mm -hmm. and was able to tell his story. And actually the book, the book um, ends with the sheet music of a song that Robert Nakata and I wrote about Larry in his honor 
And, um, and actually one of the reasons I think for, at least for me, why those, the events we did in Gallup are so powerful was that we, we played the song. Yeah. JJ Otero. JJ Otero, yeah. um, learned this. I, I gave him the sheet music and he, and he learned this music and he, and he played it. And actually it's, if you're interested in seeing that, it's on the Red Nation, the Red Nation podcast, or not the podcast, right? Is it? We did do a podcast episode, actually. But there's a video podcast, yeah. video cast of, yeah. So you could actually um, see Red that. Red Nation's event. YouTube channel, you can watch it there. Yeah, too. The, Red, the Red Nation YouTube channel, you can see JJ Otero play the music. And, and that event, um, two of Larry's sisters, uh, Ursula and Erica, were there. So, so that's the, the sort of the, I think, the uh, a summary just to get us to what you'll need to know in this passage. And this, this is a short passage that I think provides. A, a kind of an overbook of the entire entire book, because I don't think we can understand, or I knew who my readers would be, and many of them would not be native, and many of them would not understand this history, and need needed to understand. I think I think what what um, what tradition of resistance Larry was part of, and what tradition of struggle he contributed to. Um, and it's so the book is really not just about Larry; it's about his mother, it's about his father. Um, and, and, and the whole sort of sweep of history that that brought brought us to the moment that Larry made the decision to to really confront the the, the sort of structure of settler colonial violence in Gallup the way he did to follow the generations of Casuses introduced introduced in this book is to enter their world a world made and remade by war and occupation the story of Larry Casus and his family is a story of a long unbroken line of generations that links the shootout with police in the sporting goods store in 1973 that killed Larry to the Johnson massacre of 1837 that killed Juan Jose Compa, another native leader killed by vigilantes or by police. The Johnson massacre examined in the book's third chapter established U.S. control of the world's most profitable copper mine, where a century later Larry would be born, where his, where his father Lewis would work as a miner and where the most radical labor union in the U.S. would organize mine workers. The story of the Casus family links the rough streets of Gallup, where Larry would live and die, to the war-torn streets of occupied Salzburg, Austria, in the 1930s and 40s, where Larry's mom, Lillian, was born into a crumbling empire and raised in another, and where Louis, Larry's father, would patrol as an occupation soldier during the post-war occupation of Austria. Theirs is a story that links the reservation trading posts on the Navajo Nation, an industry that sentenced generations of Navajos into debt servitude, to the company stores of the Kennecott Mine in Santa Rita, where Larry was raised. The arc of the Casus family follows the arc of U.S. colonial war and occupation. The important moments of their lives overlay like a map on the world historical events of the 19th and 20th centuries. Larry's great-great-grandfather, Jesus Arviso, the subject of the fourth chapter, is famous and revered among Navajos. He was kidnapped from his Mexican family as a child, raised from the Apache, or traded from the Apache to the Navajo as a boy, and raised among the Navajo, to whom he became a legendary leader. Larry's maternal grandfather, Richard Hutzler, fought in two world wars, the Royal Bavarian Army of the German Empire drafted him into the military on the same day it declared war on France in 1914. He fought as a lowly private in the wars that ended empires in Europe and was discharged from the army the day after Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated and the German Empire collapsed and the day before the doomed Weimar Republic was declared. Larry's mother, Lillian, celebrated her third birthday watching Nazis march through the streets of Salzburg, Austria, her hometown. She celebrated her eighth birthday hiding from Allied bombs that nearly destroyed Salzburg. She was almost 10 when the Soviets invaded from the north and the Americans from the west, ending the war and beginning the post-war occupation of Austria. Lillian's personal story is part of the apocalyptical story of war and occupation in mid-century Europe. War and occupation are apocalyptic for all, but more so for girls and women, Allied troop Troops raped tens of thousands of women during the occupation. After the war, thousands more migrated to the U.S. from war-torn Europe as war brides, including Lillian. Larry's father, Louis, fought in the two bloodiest European battles that American troops fought in World War II, was captured by the Wehrmacht in the Battle of the Bulge, and was held in a Nazi POW camp until his liberation. 
Lewis rejoined the army after the war. He met Lillian in Salzburg, where he patrolled the prisoner of war and dis displaced persons camp, camps during the U.S. occupation of Austria. After he was discharged, Lewis returned to New Mexico and worked in the same mine made possible by the genocidal Mexican war against Apaches of 100 years earlier. He was one of only two Navajo mine workers ever to join the radical union made famous in the film Salt of the Earth, which chronicled the strike by the International Union of Mine, Mill, and Smelter Workers against Empire Zinc. No history of that union or that strike tells his story. So forget Plymouth Rock and all the other stories of American exceptionalism that celebrate colonization. Look instead at Santa Rita, New Mexico, where settler colonialism was born in the blood of Apaches murdered by American mercenaries, where it was raised by settlers in copper mines that existed only because of the bloody murder of Apaches, and where it came of age in grim and violent border towns such as Gallup, New Mexico, those horrible machines of native misery, suffering, and resistance. To understand Larry Casus is to understand this history. So we start in Santa Rita, New Mexico, where violence against the Apaches established the conditions for windfall profits for American mining companies. And then there's Larry's father, Lewis, who led a life that explodes the stereotype as Navajos, of Navajos as passive or help, helpless victims of colonial conquest. He escaped boarding school, survived tuberculosis, fought a world war, patrolled a European city as an occupier, brought a war bride home with him, joined the most radical labor union in the U.S. in the 1950s. And then there's Gallup, a city calibrated to convert the suffering and misery of Navajo people into great wealth and security for settlers. This is still true today. And this is where the Casuses would eventually move and where Larry would come of age. Yeah, it makes me, uh, that passage you just read, David, I'm trying to think about, you know, for folks who aren't like intimately familiar with this person, right, or this history, or don't come from this part of the world, trying to describe like what makes it really significant in a way I think that resonates. And I will say this, uh, you know, the, the narrative, the American exceptionalist narrative, even sometimes those of us in progressive and radical and left spaces, um, we think that a place like New York City, where we are today, right, is the epicenter of the struggle um, in the so-called United States. And it's important to realize that the Ameri what is considered the American Southwest, you know, the Red Power Movement, which I think most people, when people think about the history of indigenous liberation, they associate it, I think, with the Red Power Movement. That's kind of the strongest version, right, in this long kind of tradition and history of indigenous liberation that most people are familiar with. I think even more familiar is usually the American Indian movement um, from the 70s, particularly the 60s and the 70s, um, the creation of American Indian or Native American studies departments like the kind that I've worked in for the past five years. Uh, and I think oftentimes when people think about the American Indian movement, they associate it with a certain geography, whether it's the Midwest, right, or the Great Plains. And so I think what the story of Larry and then what this book does for those of us who maybe have some ideas about where the movement lives, right? Or like where the movement comes from or these spots where the emergence or the origin stories of some of the most powerful iterations of our radical movements, you know, in the history of like the progressive movement more broadly, but certain indigenous liberation. What Larry's story shows us is that sometimes movements come from unlikely places, right? Or they don't come from like the, the core or the thing or the city necessarily, right? The things I think that sometimes we tell ourselves um, is where like the action is really happening and like where, you know, things are really going down. And no one really thinks that Gallup, New Mexico, right? Or even Albuquerque, New Mexico is this place where there are origin stories for red power. For example, Larry was a protagonist in the, the 60s and the 70s of the emergence of red power as one of the most radical and revolutionary formations in the history of the United States, not just for indigenous people, but across the movement, right? In that history. And that, that came from that particular place and that location for a reason. Reservation border towns, Amer the American Indian movement emerged, right, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but that was to combat police violence. And the American Indian movement song is for a, a relative named Raymond Yellow Thunder who was brutally murdered by vigilantes 
in a border town uh, bordering Pine Ridge Reservation um, in Nebraska, but just over the border from South Dakota. And so Red Power came out of reservation border towns because of the rampant, just disgusting violence that Native people, working class Native people, Native people living on the streets were experiencing from police, from white settler vigilantes, usually men, white men, and just the, the systemic and systematic violence, um, whether it was through liquor licenses at these kinds of establishments like the Navajo Inn. And so Larry, the reason why Larry is important is because he helped to put Red Power on the map and, um, and then it exploded in a much larger way, nationally and internationally. And so his importance to the history of Red Power and therefore the entire, you know, the, the arc of the struggle for indigenous liberation and revolutionary struggle in the so-called United States really can't be overstated. And so just trying to describe a little bit about, it's not just like you had to know him, you know, you, or you like, you, you have to be here. You had to be from like Albuquerque. Um, somehow New Mexico is considered this provincial uh, place, right, that doesn't really relate to other parts of the world or the country. But in fact, you know, the nuclear bomb was built in New Mexico, right? New Mexico has one of the largest military industrial complex presences of any state um, in the country. And so really New Mexico and then these border towns of New Mexico and Arizona to some extent are really are places that are incredibly rich, right? They're incredibly rich in this long history of resistance and revolutionary struggle that I believe everyone probably listening and here in the room is very dedicated and committed to. Um, and so Larry, you know, he's really, like I said, he's a protagonist in that longer history. And again, like, I, it's, it's sad that it took this long to write this book, but you know, thank you, David, <laughs> for writing the book, writing some of Larry's story and his family. Um, so now that I've said that, uh, I'm gonna read a little bit from my foreword for the book. Uh, I wrote the forward talking, I felt weird talking just about the Red Nation in the forward because I was like, this book isn't about the Red Nation. <laughs> it's like about Larry Casus. But then I thought more like, well, actually, Larry is one of the major reasons why the Red Nation ever existed in the first place. Um, of course, he transformed Kiva Club, which if you don't know, Kiva Club also has a very prominent place in the history of Red Power um, that came out of the Southwest. And so... In many ways, the Red Nation and the story of the Red Nation, which I helped to co-found in 2014, uh, it, com it would not have happened without Larry. Um, and so it's kind of a homage to Larry, but kind of telling that through some recent things that the Red Nation experienced and relating that back to, of course, the way that David um, structures the book, but also to Larry's legacy. So I'm just going to read about two and a half pages, and then we can open up for questions, or you and I can interview each other. <laughs> All right. David Correa begins An Enemy Such as This by detailing the history of scalp hunting that originated in Mexico's genocidal 19th century campaign to exterminate the Apache. The practice became so prevalent that an entire regional economy developed around it. Apache scalps outpaced beaver pelts as the most valuable commodity on the frontier. Mexican politicians and American and French businessmen subsidized this lucrative enterprise. Often politicians and businessmen were the same people, as the story of the Santa Rita mine owner Stephen, Cur Stephen Cursier demonstrates, a story Correa documents to tell the colonial history of Santa Rita copper mine where Larry Casusa's father, Louis, worked and where Larry was born. Soldiers, mercenaries, and trappers became entrepreneurs, skilled in the art of the hunt. Indian killing became a profession. Fast forward to 1973. Larry is fed up with the politicians and businessmen in Gallup, New Mexico. For the previous decade, Gallup's local elite owned and operated the Navajo Inn, perhaps the most notorious liquor establishment in Gallup's history. By the late 1960s, it was the most profitable bar in the state of New Mexico. Located mere yards from the boundary of the Navajo Nation, the bar represented misery and death for Navajo people who frequently died along Highway 264 from exposure or car-related accidents. By the mid-1970s, McKinley County, with Gallup as its county seat, had the highest alcohol-related mortality rate in the nation. As Correa notes, Larry would have pointed out that Navajo misery in Gallup was not an aberration or product of past colonial conquest. 
Navajo immiseration produced the conditions that made the Gallup economy possible in the first place. Once hunted for their scalps, Indians were now hunted according to the cruel calculations of the border town's predatory economy. The trade was still their death, their flesh. The profession had been replenished with a new generation of Indian killers, pawnbrokers, liquor store owners, and traders. These were the conditions on March 1st, 1973, when the foot soldiers, i.e. cops, of Gallup's elite murdered Larry. As Correa writes, Larry's mother Lillian, who was across the street in Gallup's welfare office, recalls someone storming into the office yelling that Larry Casus finally got what he deserved. Reporters from the town's newspapers took photos of Gallup police posing with Larry's body, a souvenir from their kill. Like many native people before him, Larry had been deemed a threat, suspicious, criminal, hunted and then killed, his love for his people all the more reason to celebrate his death. The Red Nation formed in 2014 in the border towns of the Southwest, the same geographies of violence that ignited in Larry and many others, the spirit of indigenous resistance in the 1970s. We talked frequently of Larry in those early days. In fact, we still do. We collaborated closely with Kiva Club, the native student organization at the University of New Mexico, Larry helped lead 40 years earlier. When we would protest border town violence in the streets of Albuquerque and Gallup, many of us would wear Kiva Club t-shirts with Larry's face on the front, the back stating, the Indian movement was then born. It was born because we must once again regain the gap, the balance between good and evil. Those are Larry's words. Larry said these words a little over two weeks before he died. We knew from the beginning that the evil of which he spoke was the evil of settler colonialism, possessively and feverishly defended by settler men, the hunters, the killers of native people, and the anti-colonial political and social orders we carry in our souls. Like Larry, we were fed up with seeing our indigenous relatives brutalized by these modern day Indian killers. Sometimes at our protests, we would chant, what would Larry do? Just as often we would be sitting around a table or a fire plotting our next protest or event, quietly asking ourselves and each other, what would Larry do? It was never a rhetorical question, nor was it said in jest. It was always serious, and we already knew the answer. Of course we knew what Larry had done. We knew what he sacrificed, and we knew we would never turn away from our people from the flame of native liberation that Larry and so many other ancestors in the Indian movement tended to, so that our generation, indeed all future generations, could pick up the torch and carry their prayer, their story, forward. Should I keep reading or should I stop? I'll keep reading, is that okay? All right. <laughs> I'll do a dramatic reading of three more paragraphs. Okay. In this way, what would Larry do is the essence of the Red Nation. He lives on in each of us. He was alive on June 3rd, 2020, when a group of native organizers from the Red Nation, all of whom were women and LGBTQ2+, myself included, drove into Gallup to protect Navajo women and youth participating in a Diné-led solidarity march with Black Lives Matter. Gallup's wealthy downtown business owners were literally up in arms calling on citizens from across the region to join them in armed protection of their businesses from would-be looters. Of course, this was happening all over the country. As a small march of mostly Diné youth and women passed through downtown, white and Hispano men stood at business doors like sentinels, protecting the native flesh bounty hoarded inside. That's actually what pawn shops are, it's native flesh bounty. Cops perched atop roofs, tracking the mar tracked the marcher's movements. United in their hunt, these Indian killers circled the wagons against the Indian hordes, salivating at the possibility of a good kill. While they didn't get their trophy that day, I'm sure they enjoyed their hunt. A notorious motorcycle gang casually lounged outside of Camille's sidewalk cafe, keeping tabs on the marchers as they held a rally in front of the courthouse a dozen yards away. The cafe's owner, himself a wealthy and influential white businessman in the region, had offered refuge and service to those helping with the armed protection of local businesses. Camille's was the temporary hunting lodge where this generation of Indian killers fortified their settler masculinity by tracking native women and youth that day. 
While this display of unadulterated hatred might seem remarkable, I want to point out that those men were afraid of our security team. They did not expect indigenous people, let alone women, to organize protection for the marchers, to display such unadulterated love for our people, that we would stand between them and their guns and the women and youth of our nations, that we would look them in the eye and show no fear. Unlike the day Larry was killed, there was no bloodshed that day. Thank goodness there could have been. I believe this is because we prevented it. Yes, by our presence, but more so because of the prayer we carried in our hearts, the same prayer that Larry carried. We made sure Gallup knew we weren't afraid to be indigenous in our own homelands, despite its obsessively greedy claims otherwise. And we sure as hell weren't going to tolerate any more Indian killing. I think that is what Larry would have done. Um, the, uh, the Red Nation office is called the Larry Casus Freedom Center. Um, picture prominently displayed mm -hmm. there. Um, uh, the, the, the first time I met Larry's family was, was with Nick Estes, actually, in 2013, the year before the Red Nation was created. 2013? Yeah. I, wow. and, uh, and, you know, I, I think that, um, I, I don't know if, what you'd like to talk about. I'm, I'm, I just, I'm so grateful that you wrote the forward and that you wrote it about the Red Nation, because I think that was, that was exactly what that, that forward needed to, needed to be, because mm -hmm. Larry, Larry's just, he's not... Um, a story from the past, you know. Um, the purpose of the story of Larry Casus is, is as you've said, to to really provide that sort of the meaning and the courage that it's necessary to do this kind of work. Um, Larry, uh, I, I, I mean, I can't even imagine the sort of the the kind of courage Larry mustered that day. Mm. Um, and I have and I have asked myself a couple times. In particular, what would Larry do? I had a conversation with Jennifer Donette one time about after a protest when things got crazy, like, what would Larry do? And, and I was like, damn it. Because <laughs> we know what Larry did, so we, it's hard to... Yeah, he's an inoculation against all reformism. <laughs> <laughs> he's an inoculation against all reformism. <laughs> no, that's a good way to put it. No, listen, like, what I was just describing... Uh, of course, we saw, you know, we saw fascists and we saw armed white militias erupting in cities across the United States, you know, during the George Floyd uprisings of 2020. This one was no different in Gallup. It just had a different flavor because it was like native people that were the primary target as they typically are in these spaces, um, you know, simply because they border towns, border native nations and their high levels of just high populations of native people. Um, but seriously, that day was incredibly scary. I mean, if you've ever been in a frontline situation where you're facing off, not just with police, but with like armed um, vigilantes and citizens who genuinely, they really, they want blood. And that summer they really wanted blood. That wasn't the only time we actually had to confront these people many, many times. Um, that summer, I think as other comrades did in other places who were fighting um, the anti-fascist, the heroic anti-fascist struggle of that summer, um, I would imagine that the feeling that day in Gallup and the sheer terror, you could, you know, you could feel it. It had a feeling to it. It was like a, you know, it was, it was sometimes when we talk about border time, border towns, we talk about them as war zones. There's actually a part of Albuquerque that is called the war zone. You've, uh, it's the not police, even a euphemism. The police call it the war zone. The police right? call yeah, it the war the, zone, but then the, it's also known kind of colloquially as the war zone. Um, because there's so much state violence enacted against, I mean, there's prim primarily like poor and working class people of color and, and native folks and unsheltered people who live in this part of Albuquerque. It's the southeast part of the city. Um, and so that was the feeling that day. And I imagine that's not that much different than the day when Larry was murdered by the Gallup police. And so the question of like, what would Larry do is a real question because of course, the struggle for indigenous liberation I mean, we're not liberated, right? Like, the United States still exists, right? And settler colonialism, you know, I mean, people famously quote that it's a structure, not, a, not an event, but it's, a, you know, it's a living reality. 
And the reason why Larry would confront the same type of terror in Gallup in 1973 as we would in 2020 is because the project of settler colonialism is still ongoing, right? It's still pervasive, it's still structural, and it's, it's frankly, it's incredibly powerful. Um, and the violence is so extreme, um, the violence that keeps it running, the engine of settler colonialism, that it is not, you know, surprising or shocking, unfortunately, that, you know, a 50-year gap would not have really changed. Quite literally, Gallup has not changed yeah. much at all since um, Larry was murdered that day. And so what I'm trying to say is that, right, this question of, like, what Larry would do, it's a tactical question <laughs> in some situations, like what we confronted in 2020. But it's a question that we need to keep asking ourselves to keep ourselves going through, you know, a long protracted struggle against a very powerful system and a structure. But it also reflects, right, the, the nature of, um, I think it reflects the nature of the struggle itself. And so, yeah, when we ask ourselves, what would Larry do? It means all, it means all of those things. It means the things that I described earlier about the history of Red Power it means like in a moment where you're confronting your mortality, if you're on a front line trying to fight for what's right and trying to fight for your people, like you think about what Larry was confronting that day. Um, but then it also speaks, you know, to the endurance um, of having to struggle under a, a, a really powerful system like settler colonialism. Yeah, Larry, Larry was, a, was an organizer for many years. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I think that one of the answers to what would Larry do requires um, like looking at the work he did as an organizer. And, um, you know, one of the ways I think Larry, you, know, you describe Larry as really this foundational figure in the um, American Indian movement. And one of the reasons why I think that is is because the, the kind of organizing they did constituted a real break from the kind of sort of like reformist, a lot of reformist organizing on some native groups in the, in the 60s and 70s. And they just had no interest in, in like seeking recognition from the settler state. Right. They were not interested in appealing to the state or appealing to settlers. Um, in fact, um, you know, in the, the last chapter, the New Yorker, by the way, since we're in New York, I think, the New Yorker wrote articles about Larry Casus, actually, um, and were just dumbfounded by, by Larry Casus and Indians Against Exploitation because they just wouldn't talk to them. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and they were like, what? And they would have lengthy, um, like, like, press, like um, press conferences, but all in Navajo. They would refuse to speak English or, or they would just turn the microphone over to a, a medicine man who would, you know, didn't even, couldn't speak English. So, and they didn't, they didn't make sense, right? Because they, because they didn't understand, they, they thought that they would find a familiar group of young people interested in development and seeking out ways to, um, to acquire resources from the state. And instead they, they got groups of kids that didn't care a fuck about them, you know, just didn't, didn't even want to be talking to them, to the New Yorker or any of the sort of these white institutions that, that Larry and his comrades understood were like essentially at the center of the problems that they were, they were confronting and facing. And, and, and that, I think that's one of the sort of like, what would Larry do? One of the answers that I always come to, which is like this sort of the particular way they went about the organizing and mm -hmm. who they organized with and who their comrades were, um, because Indians Against Exploitation and then the group that came, that followed in its wake after the violence that ended Larry's life, the Coalition for Navajo Liberation, was a real coalition that, that, um, that one of Larry's closest comrades, John Redhouse, was, was, was a part of. And, and actually, on the, if anyone, by the way, if anyone is going to be in Albuquerque um, in March of next year, this is the 50th anniversary of Larry's murder, which um, is not a thing to celebrate, but it's a thing to, um, it's a thing that will, it's what, it's going to be a moment to, that will bring us together. And Melanie will be interviewing John Redhouse, um, who, um, no one knows John Redhouse's name, unfortunately, but John Redhouse is an intellectual. No, also a legend. A, a legendary like figure. Um, and when he, he read a manuscript for this book, um, and when he emailed me and said, well, he doesn't, he doesn't even email. So he didn't, he, I don't know how he got that. Did word. he call you? He, no, he didn't call <laughs> me. He, he, I wish he would call me, but he didn't call me. But sometimes I get things in the mail from John, like just notes or something. But he said, this is the best thing ever written about Larry. That was all he said. And then he had some suggestions and I put them all in the book, just as John said to. But 
But when he said that, I was like, okay, because I, I, I think that I was, I didn't want to write a book that, um, like, you know, just used Larry in order to make an argument or took advantage of this history to tell an interesting story, but rather this, this has to live up to, um, you know, the commitments that Larry, um, established for us. And, and so I don't know if it has. I think everything is uh, ultimately never quite uh, how we would wish them to be. But, um, but I, I, it took me a long time to write because of that. Because I, I just, you know, when I started this book, I, I, I just was like, well, I can't write this book yet. I'm not the writer yet. I'm not the organizer yet. Um, and so, you know, he was my teacher. Larry was, was, yeah. um, was my teacher. This 19-year-old kid was my teacher. Yeah. I mean, there are... There's still not just the Red Nation, but just powerful Native organizations that, in this way, really give the middle finger to reform, <laughs> right? It's not the strategy to go about the work of organizing for liberation um, and, and how we go about struggle. And, you know, there's, there's conflicts within the movement about, about these things, right, about whether or not we should partake in reform or we should do non-reformist reform or we should be anti-reform and it can be quite difficult but it's actually very important I think that there there need to be confrontational arms sometimes we talk about this in the red nation so right now in the the struggle for climate justice right to turn back the tide of climate change indigenous people are quite literally the most confrontational arm of the climate justice struggle and we need confrontational arms of our struggles. We need, we need that. And so uh, I would say that at that time, right, Indians Against Exploitation, Coalition for Navajo Liberation, I mean, right, when you're actually seeing people die every day on the streets, when you see the police violence so extreme, what are you going to do except confront it? That's what you do. That's the moral response. <laughs> that is the reasonable response just as we saw two years ago, two and a half years ago here, um, after George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. And so it's reasonable, but it's also confrontational. And that's how Larry spoke, actually. He was very, like, logical. He would reason through something. He'd be like, this is why we're doing this. And he's like, and, I mean, he never did this, but it's the proverbial, now we're going to throw a brick through your window kind of thing, right? He sort of did that. He actually kind of did that. <laughs> he yeah. actually kind of did that. <laughs> <laughs> when he was when he was Kivikal president, he would le send letters to um, like local shopkeepers in Albuquerque who had like you know would have like cigar store Indians and like and just just that, and he would be like you're gonna have to remove that or or we're gonna take care of it. It was just very clear. He's like get rid of that because we're coming. If you Which don't. is a reasonable and appropriate response to racism, right? Um, and so yeah, when we that's another way of looking at like when we ask ourselves what would Larry do, it's like yeah. It's a, it's a completely understandable and reasonable response, everything that he did. But what I appreciate about this book is that, it, like you said, David, um, most people only know about the way he died. Like if you look in the archive about Larry, there's just all, there's so much about the way he died. And so little of the book is about that. I think it maybe takes up 15 pages. At the very end, the book isn't even about that. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to write the foreword about, it's not really about like what Larry said. I use the word sacrifice. I actually wish I would change it, but you know, writer's remorse, <laughs> things that you publish. Um, it's not so much about what he sacrificed, right? It's about how he lives on in us and in the struggle uh, in all of the ways we've already mentioned, I think five or six different ways that Larry lives on. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to point that out also in the book. Um, I before we end this and open it up for questions, I, I, I also just want to thank Haymarket for. Um, I, I I said in in my acknowledgments that um, most presses think they're doing writers a favor, but not Haymarket. I love Haymarket; they, they're they're great. Um, every everyone with Haymarket really brought a kind of like mission to this book that I appreciated. They understood what it meant to a lot of people, and um, I'm, I'm I'm really so glad that that Haymarket published this and um and also mostly that Larry's family liked the book yeah special shout out to Larry's family I think that I had never 
taken the time or there had never really been an opportunity to interact with his family and to really understand their perspective on Larry. And that happened this past spring and that was incredibly important. And I think when we speak about Larry, we meaning people in the movement who aren't actual like relatives, blood relatives to Larry, not in his family, didn't experience the loss, I think in the same way that his family did. It means something different to them. And this book, they, they felt a little somehow about, some of them felt a little somehow about some of the parts of this book. And they certainly don't always feel the same way that those of us in the movement feel about Larry and his significance to us. Like we claim Larry. And I think it, that it's, it's important in the movement work. Like even though we claim people sometimes as like our heroes or as our relatives, our comrades in struggle, uh, interacting with his family gave it a different dimension Mm -hmm. Um, and I still haven't actually entirely processed that I don't have a full point here. It's just being mindful of that because when we are in struggle, we're, we're people in struggle. We come from people, <laughs> right? And it's important for us to be in right relationship with the people of the people that we struggle with because goodness knows, like, Red Nation, I would never have been able to put all of this effort into the Red Nation had I not had an entire family of support who worry about me and, I mean, really are terrified every time I go out onto a front line and those types of things. And so really, like, the community of the movement is massive if you consider the people of the people, I think, who do the kind of things that Larry does. Well, I, so. I, and I, and I want to just point out that, you know, Larry... Uh, he was, Larry was a target. He was, a, he was a prominent organizer and activist, and he was Native. And if you're a prominent Native organizer and activist, particularly in the Southwest, you're a target of vigilantes or police. And, and you know, you, you have been yeah. a target and have had vigil, vigilant, vigilantes march on your home. Um, and so I know that you, you know a little bit about what Larry confronted every day. Yeah, that's why I would, I mean, I didn't share that tonight, but that's, <laughs> That was part of what happened in 2020, and it's actually part of the reason why I left Albuquerque, because uh, I didn't feel safe <laughs> anymore in Albuquerque, because uh, I was doxxed and a bunch of uh, white militia and fash tried to march on my home. But that's just because I did what Larry was, I, I asked myself, what would <laughs> well, Larry know, do? Like... At the very beginning, I watched a comrade get shot at a statue removal protest the second week of June, and things were, yeah, I mean, things were erupting everywhere. They certainly were in New Mexico and Albuquerque. And I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm going to call out all of these fascists in the media. And I was one of the only people doing it. I, it's, sometimes people don't recognize fascism like as it's unfolding. And so I was like, this is what's happening. These are what these people are doing. They pulled a gun on us on June 1st. This is this and this. And so because I was so vocal, and of course, because I'm a Native woman who's like, you know, the primary target <laughs> of the kind of the hunt, right? The, the hunt I talk about in the forward the way that this that settler vigilantes um, form their masculinity and their identity through hunting native people. They hunted me. I myself was hunted. So I too know what it feels like, right, to be um, an organizer, a native organizer who speaks out. And because it's the right thing to do, <laughs> it's the right thing to do to call fascism fascism and to speak out against white supremacy. That's the right thing to do. It's a reasonable and a moral response, just like what Larry did right around um, alcohol sales uh, and, and those types of things in the 70s. But yeah, I was hunted. It's a, it changes you. I'm not going to make this about me, but it changes you as a revolutionary and an organizer, I think, when you're put in that position. And in that way, I think there's also something I understood more deeply about Larry after that experience. Yeah, there's nothing romantic about getting assassinated. So I'm, and I understand why you left. And why would you stay? Because the University of New Mexico's response was to allow police snipers onto the roof of UNM buildings during marches to, to, to have snipers pointing guns at us while we were marching. And so, that, you know, there's, this wasn't a safe place any longer. And I understand that. <laughs> but still, I wish you would not have left. Who knows? I'll probably make my way back I know, that's there. You know true. how things we'll, work. We'll get you back. <laughs> We'll get you back. All right. Well, I I, um, I haven't seen you in a while, so we could probably chat for a while. For I know, but we don't need to do this in no, front no. of all of you. <laughs> well, you I, can go about your evenings. <laughs> so I, mean, I always hesitate, like, oh, let's have Q&A now, because then I'm always nervous. No one will have questions. But do Q&A? But is Comments? it yes, Q&A if anyone has questions? Anyone? Or... I know. I have questions as the person with the mic, but if anyone else has a question, you can go first. Okay. <laughs> I'm just 
pretty funny. I don't feel like I need the mic. Anyhow, um, <laughs> so I, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, more stories about Larry because you, you've, I feel like you all have referenced as opposed to have sharing in more detail. Like, so you gave the example of, of the, you know, how we would go after the, the shopkeepers, the racist shopkeepers, things like that. Yeah. But I, if, if there are other anecdotes or stories about the way he organized and, and you know, when you lift him up as, a, as an organizer, not just a martyr, obviously, but like somebody who, you know, you really follow because of his, his, his the way he organized. I'd love to hear more about some, some of the, the ways he went about organizing. Sure. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I'll just tell a, a couple of stories. I mean, I, I think one, one thing that Larry did, um, he, he, everyone I talked to, everyone, I mean, all of his friends, all, his family, everyone would describe him as this just like very intelligent, gentle person, caring, gentle person, and very thoughtful. And it was never putting himself like in front of people and was, and, and was the guy who, when he, when he was finally met, like his people, like his the or, the comrades that he would organize with, he was the one that did all the he would he would show up to the office and and do all the mimeographing, you know, and he would do all the sort of hard, you know, the just tedious work. But then when they would sit down and they would strategize, you know, there at the in the in the late sixties when they were trying to stop the ceremonial, which was this was an event in Gallup every year that was at the time the largest tourist event in the state of New Mexico. And it was this intertribal ceremonial that they would have, um, but it was owned by the Chamber of Commerce, basically. And so the Navajo Nation opposed it, but did nothing really to stop it. So these young organizers with IE decided they were going to shut it down. And the early years, you know, the, 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 the protests were silent protests, and they were very reserved in terms, there was, there was nothing much confrontational. And so one of the first, this is, a, a, this is an anecdote that, that appears briefly in the book, and I'll mention it. Um, and his, a, a, a friend of his told me this story um, who was at the meeting and they were like, well, we got a plan for the new protest against the ceremonial. What should we do? And Larry's, they just met Larry, some of them. And Larry's answer is like, well, you know, the, um, there's a hill above the entrance to the ceremonial. So what we should do is we should get some tires, set them on fire and just roll them down the hill toward the ceremonial. <laughs> and everyone was like, or, or Phil Loretto, who told me the story, was like, Larry, they're just, they will just shoot us. They will shoot us. You know? But they actually, there was, there was gunfire two years later when they did peaceful marches, and they came around at sort of more confrontational protests later because they could never stop it. But when they actually escalated their protests and they put their bodies in front of, of, of you know, the people that were running the place, they were able to shut down one of this, the sacred dances from being performed, which was performed out of context. And, you know, and so, I mean, he, he, he was just really interesting in the way it would, he, that this very reserved, quiet, thoughtful, intelligent young man also knew when to, okay, now we escalate. Yeah. And also, I got some work to do at the office. Somebody's got to do that hard everyday work. That was what Larry would do. And Larry was, uh, and continues to be vilified, right? People who... In, you could be peacefully protesting. You could be rolling burning tires down a hill. It doesn't matter. If you're Native, you're going to be vilified just because we live in a settler society. And so, so much of the coverage around Larry was like, oh, he was this like militant, you know, he was this radical. And he had, a, he had radical ideas, but that was because he was a student of history. His, his family, this is, I'm trying to, his family was trying to remind everyone this spring during the book launch events they're like, actually, Larry was a good relative. He was loving. He was gentle. He raised all of his siblings. And he was such an avid reader. He was a true intellectual. And it was from this place, this was who he was. He truly loved his people. And he understood, like you said, that sometimes you have to do certain things, right, in order for your people to have a better life. That's really just what Larry stood for. And he was actually like a wonderful person. And it's ridiculous that you actually have to say those things about Native people. But truly, and we see this all the time, the way that organizers or just organizers, these important people are vilified um, and spoken about. 
And so his family really, I remember one after the other, they really wanted to remind everyone that that's actually who Larry was. He was a gentle soul, I think is what one of his aunties said about him. Yeah, and I, and I hope that comes out in the book too because I try yeah. to write a lot about, about that. And one more anecdote I think I want to say in the, the beginning. Um, the young man that they kidnapped at gunpoint and forced to drive them to Gallup in order to kidnap the, the mayor, never talked to anybody, refused to talk to anyone. And I don't know why he agreed to talk to me years later. But... What he told me was, and he was this, he was a, a white dude. He was studying to be a doctor and he's a urologist now in Texas. And I flew to Texas to meet, to, to interview him years ago. This was in 2013. I interviewed him actually. And he, he just was coming back from class and he gets kidnapped and at gunpoint and thrown in the car and handcuffed and they drive to Gallup. And he, by the end of the trip, he, and he told me, he's like, listen, I want you to know, so you know, I'm conservative. He's like, I'm no John Bircher, but you know, I'm conservative. I don't give a shit about all these protests and, you know, because the University of New Mexico campus was just in an uproar at that time in the early 70s. Um, had a very prominent SDS chapter and Kiva Club was pretty radical. And he's like, I didn't care about any of these people. By the end of this two-hour drive, he's like, well, Larry was right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and Larry, I mean, just sort of this, Larry had, he was like, it's just, he just, the way he described Larry, was, he was just this very sort of like soft-spoken, intelligent guy. He tried everything. He's, like, he's such a logical guy. He's like, how could, he's like, he was right. He really tried everything. He'd gone through before city council. Yeah, no, he tried to like shut down the of, bar the to save people's tactics. lives, right? Yeah. But just the way that like he had this sort of patience and he didn't just dismiss Delbert Rudy, the guy that kidnapped him. And then, you know, and, and, and also that Delbert Rudy, this guy, I mean, maybe it's Stockholm Syndrome, who knows, but he... At the end of this two hours, he was like, and so he, the reason he refused to talk to people all these years was because Larry is vilified always. I mean, you know, someone put a wheat paste poster up in Gallup one time a few years ago and all hell broke loose. And then, you know, the cops came out and letters to the editor decrying this violent Larry Casus. And when I wrote a piece in 2013 about a Kiva Club ceremony in Larry's honor, we had to turn off the comments online because of the things people were saying about Larry. Um, so it's just, it just was just remarkable to me that, that, you know, he, he had just a thoughtfulness that made people trust him, understand that, that this guy, when he makes decisions to do things that might seem militant or radical, but what, what choice did he have? This isn't really a remarkable kind of person to do something like that, to be able to talk to across those divides and convince people who refuse to be convinced and yet still are convinced. And the stories about him being an organizer, like the stuff that isn't the heroic stuff, the stuff that you don't, you know, get on YouTube <laughs> talking about, like the, the putting the chairs, which I'm sure I will help with that <laughs> later after this event, right? The mimeograph, I don't know what mimeographing is because well, I'm too young, but like, like, you know, the people. <laughs> How old are you? <laughs> well, you don't know what mimeographing is. I don't know what Remember when you smell it? Never mind. Okay. The, is it like the carbon copy? Is it like the... It is. It's it's a hand crank where you it's in order to make in order to make copies. Look at this. You're, Got an intergenerational organizing I'm not, conversation. I'm not even that old. I mean, <laughs> I'm really, how old? Okay. I I'm so, I've never I've never mimeographed anything. I'm just saying it's just the hard work that you do. It's like you cook the food for the people. Yes. You put the chairs right. away. You take them back out multiple times a week. Right. You know, you're the one you're like trying to design the poster and you don't know what to put on it. And then you're having you're like getting painting the banner and then you get paint on your favorite shirt. Like it's that kind of stuff, right? Yes. It is the non-heroic grind of what it means to be an organizer. And Larry did that. He was he was a true relative. He was a true revolutionary. His heart and soul was in the struggle. And again, right, when we ask ourselves, what would Larry do? Larry would sweep the damn floor. <laughs> That's what Larry would do, too. He studied. He did the work, behind-the-scenes work. You know, he put himself on the line. He took care of his own family. He was really an exceptional relative, an exceptional Diné person in that regard, and a beautiful revolutionary. I have all kinds of questions now about your personal life, Melanie. <laughs> Is she like 20? Yeah. Like, it's, it's what, all that I didn't mimeograph before? Yeah. <laughs> That's for another time. Um, but one of the things that I'm thinking about is something that you were just raising, David, about kind of the climate 
uh, at the on the campus at that time. And I'm just wondering if you all can say a little bit more about that context, particularly in relationship to other kinds of struggles, campus struggles that were happening at the time. Was that informing kind of the Kiva Club? Was that informing more broadly how people were understanding what the struggle was? So I'm thinking about, you know, what might be happening at University of San Francisco, right? University of California, San Francisco in the fight for ethnic studies, for instance, in a similar period. So can you help us put that context together? Sure, yeah. I, I mean, um, I, I would say, uh, you know, one of Larry's campaigns that he launched probably, I, I would say in 73, we just won, which was the mural. I mean, like Larry, one of the, you know, Larry, um, well, the Kiva, the Kiva, the, there were, there were um, you know, the National Guard on campus shooting students that happened at UNM. I mean, it, it wasn't just Kent State. Uh, National Guard bayoneted and then shot a, a UNM student. Um, about the same time, it's about in 73, there were, there were the, both the New Mexico State Police and the, um, the Air Force Police from Kirtland Air Force Base had infiltrated campus um, and and students, and particularly students for a democratic society, they had infiltrated them, who were allies with 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 um, Kiva Club and Larry Casus. Larry, I mean, a lot of the sort of campus stuff Larry was doing was was really confrontational with with the institution and with other student groups too. But but allied with with um, a lot of the sort of black activists on campus who threw paint on a. Uh, a basketball court in the middle of before a game started in the, the famous pit and the Kiva club was there with this black activists. And, um, but mostly was were, were Larry and a lot of his comrades were traveling from, from Pueblo to Pueblo and from the reservation into s schools and, and trying to do as much to build connections beyond the campus. Um, and because he, he, the campus, the university of New Mexico is still a pretty hostile place. If you're native, I mean, um, we, we organized a march a few years ago on campus in which it was, it was during the uh, one of the beginning of the red nation campaign to abolish Columbus day. And, and so it was on what is now independent, um, indigenous people's day in New Mexico. Uh, we were marching on campus and, um, the sort of level of hostility just from white students was just right, really pretty remarkable. I mean, just the open, I, I, I actually looked through it. I have, I took photos of the white student hostility. And then when we marched on the street, the sort of like people were like these trucks would, would come close to us and like gun it and like coal roll us. And it was like, I have a picture of, of like the smoke, like covering all of us marching. Um, so the University of Mexico is a very hostile place, um, particularly to, to native students. The old Kiva Club offices were demolished, uh, and they never replaced that. Um, and so, the, but but it was a pretty. There were a lot of of, of groups allied with Kiva Club and, and trying to work for them. Um, and Larry's Larry's focus really was very much though on Gallup when he he was trying. And also, you have to read the book. And I think this would be too much to talk about. Larry was also the, the state was trying to incarcerate Larry. Larry had been was being um, prosecuted for um, an act. He accidentally hit a woman on the road, another Nav a Navajo woman. And so he was just hounded by police and followed by police. And, and um, really his whole, the six months prior to the police killing him, I, I, I'm, it's re quite remarkable that he was able to do all the organizing he did during that, that period. Um, and, uh, but, there was at the time a pretty, pretty um, uh, large cadre of, of of native activists on campus who come back to who we brought them back to campus mm -hmm. a few years ago when John Redhouse came and and we're telling stories about the the work they were doing and a lot of those stories was how how little support I mean there was a small group of support beyond Kiva Club for native students in the seventies on campus but. I, I, I don't know how to talk about it without just dis describing the real hostility toward toward Native students on campus at the time. Yeah, I'm trying to remember, um, someone wrote a book about the National Guard incident at UNM. When was that, 73? Wait, it was, was, it, it, was, it was either 73 or 72, actually, I think. And thinking about that in the larger context of like politically what was going on in movements at the time, 
And I mean, you did the deep dive into Larry's life, but like John Redhouse, who I'm more familiar with, right? This uh, Navajo intellectual and organizer that uh, David referenced, who was very close to Larry. John, I think many of the the native, particularly the Diné people who were doing organizing at that time, who were so bereft of anything about us or organizing about us that it seemed quite singular, actually, the focus. And if you read John Redhouse's work, it's just, it is like singularly focused on like Navajo history and kind of a confrontational, like an antagonism with U.S. colonial history. And there isn't, from what I can tell, much of a gesture or maybe even an awareness sometimes of like what was influencing like the politically what was going on on the ground or even the way that people like Larry or John or others were conceptualizing indigenous liberation in relationship to what else was going on. Um, I will say that for the Red Nation, we're like extremely conscious actually of the different political traditions like the black radical tradition, feminist and queer politics that very much are woven into who we are and created, I think, the conditions for our emergence as much as Larry Casus or Red Power from this era. Um, but we're, I think we live in maybe a different time where that's that kind of intersectionality is something that's much more prominent on the minds of folks who are organizing. But yeah, I think it was kind of like a, it was kind of like an all native all the time kind of vibe, I would say in the seventies. And I, you know, give, you know, think what you will of it. I'm sure it had limitations, but God damn it, somebody had to do it because nobody, you know, nobody was doing this for Native people. And thank goodness that these Native people were just like very into being Indigenous and were proud of being Indigenous in such hostile terrain. And we're just like, yeah, like power to the people, power to Indigenous people, and just went like a thousand percent in that direction. Yeah, um, the, the young man that Larry... Uh, kidnapped uh, Delbert Rudy to go to Gallup with Robert Nakata and I had just graduated from art school and uh, he came to New Mexico and they had just met um, the previous fall and he he's passed away and I talked to him once briefly on the phone but never really had a chance to talk to him before he passed away at length but he, he there's there was an interview he did um, that he described what you know what you know what went into his thinking and what he was doing and he and he the way he described it was like I was I just wanted to hang out with Indian people he's like I was done with art school I just wanted to I just wanted to do art and hang out with Indian people and and there was a real um but also a, a real um disillusionment with a lot of their leaders who like the day before Larry and Robert kidnapped Albert Rudy to go to Gallup they went to a conference in Albuquerque with just uh, native leaders from all over New Mexico. And they were just like, they're all drinking. He's like, they're all drinking. And they're just talking about like getting grants from the federal government. And he's like, <laughs> this is, these, these are our leaders. And they, there was a real disillusionment that, that, uh, that they were dealing with that um, my, in some ways I think, and, and I don't want to like, you know, dig into the psychology of Larry Casus, but his his comrades did describe it that way. Like they didn't have that disillusionment, and and um, the, the same the same degree that Larry did. Like he was really, and it I think it has something to do too with like you know he was the state was trying to incarcerate him, and it looked very much like he was going to be going to jail. And you know his parents had just gotten divorced, and he you know he was really alienated from. Um, sister a sister who had been incarcerated and so you know it was a, a difficult time for him so the fact that he was doing that organizing at all um is quite remarkable i mean I, yeah. I, I, yeah yeah i can ask the final question but um thank you for bringing the story because i mean i know for me as a native new yorker the context is very different um so it's really fascinating to hear about um you know, uh, about Larry and how he ignited student organizing and um, indigenous struggle there um, and continues to. Um, my question is just more, it's, it's a pretty straightforward one, but I think maybe I'll round out this talk well, um, was about the title of the book. Um, if you could speak to choosing the title, um, why it was important to present the book this way. I mean, I know there's a little bit about it in the book's uh, like blurb, but I'm curious about, um, you know, the enemy that, that Larry is fighting, that I think we're all fighting in organizing all over. But um, yeah, if you both could speak to that, thanks. 
This title was the last thing written. <laughs> it was very hard to title this book. I didn't quite, I didn't, I didn't, um, I'm usually, I'm usually okay with titles. I don't know why. This was a hard one to, to title. And um, I, I thought, you know, we, we, I was talking with other people. Jennifer Denatel, one of my colleagues, um, was helpful working through some, and, and, and Haymarket was really helpful in this. And I, I just, I thought it was important to have the title be in Larry's words. And to really identify what you just said, um, Kate, which is, is what 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 are we fighting against here? And and the t the the, I mean, maybe I'll actually, um, I don't know if I actually I probably probably can't find it. There's an ex more extended quote later in the text um, in the context of that. But but here's the here's a shorter version. About two weeks before police killed him, um, Larry testified before a, like a New Mexico Senate uh, c commission or committee considering the nomination of the mayor of Gallup to be a, a regent. And he, he went to oppose it. And he wrote out um, a lengthy sort of essay uh, before that. And, that, and that, that's, that's been published in a few places. And John Redhouse created a, a, like a, a reader of a lot of stuff that included some things that Larry had written, and that's where I found it in the archive. I found it in John Redhouse's. Actually, John gave it to me, and since then he's created an archive at the University of New Mexico, and you could find it there. Um, and, and, and and in it, Larry. This is two weeks before he he would be killed by police, and he. It's the clearest statement of him, like of his thinking and his politics, and. Um, and I, I mean, I'll just read the, the and, and it serves as um, the epigraph to the, to one or two, to the book. But um, he writes, and he's talking about the settlers, obviously. They brought disease, raped our women, killed our brothers, the animals, murdered our elders, leveled out the vast forests, polluted our rivers, filled our air with chemicals, called us savage, pagans, Indians. Never before had we ever had an enemy such as this. <laughs> and so I thought, I thought that that would probably be the the best, um, you know. That, that that was it would have to a title would have to be in his words, and I think that those were I think his most powerful words, at least for me. I mean, I thought those were pretty powerful words. <laughs> You're smiling, so that's a good choice. No, I mean it's profound. I'm sitting with it <laughs> every time I read it or hear it. Yeah. It's truth. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess. Yeah, I mean, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, for everyone. For, um, there's, for yeah. everyone online, there's thousands of people here. There would have been no seats if you came. So. <laughs> um, and don't forget Back to get to the book at 1804 Books yes. and support the authors and, of course, share Larry's story. Thanks. Yes.